Management fees in private equity. Is it paying the bills or pocketing the cash? Let's find out which. A perennial topic in private equity is the issue of the management fees paid by the LPs to the GP for managing the fund they have committed to. Part of my job when I was managing my fund was to take care of the budget and make sure there was enough to go around to pay salaries and rent. In my case, I was managing a mid-cap fund, so we had to make sure all our expenses were covered. But what about the large funds? That's where there is often debate in the industry. Let's give the issue a bit of context first. GPs get remunerated in two ways. The first is through management fees, which are calculated as a percentage of the total size of the fund, with a percentage uh, typically being between 1% and 2%. A large fund would be more likely to have a lower percentage fee, and a smaller fund a higher percentage fee. This is due to the fact that there are diseconomies of scale in the smaller funds, uh, in the sense that you need a minimum structure of people and offices even to manage a very small fund. The second way GPs get remunerated is through the results-based component, the carried interest. This is a bonus payment calculated as a percentage of the capital gain the fund realises when exiting an investment, minus some deductions. Typically, this percentage is 20%. The interests of the LPs and GP generally converge on the carry. No one objects to someone being paid for results. The interests diverge on the management fees. Simply put, the LPs would like to see the lowest possible management fees so that the GP will be motivated by the results part of the remuneration. The GP would like higher management fees to have a secure income during the period. So what's the issue here? The issue is the black box issue. Stick around and let's see what that means. It's been the tradition and custom in the private equity industry that the LPs hand over the management fees as a black box. The cash is handed over, usually quarterly in advance, to the GP, who disposes of the money as he sees fit. It is very rare for the GP to share the breakdown of how the fees are spent, and this has broadly remained the case, despite occasional attempts by the LPs to move towards full disclosure or a cost-plus based system where the GP would have to submit an annual detailed budget. The concern by LPs is legitimate. The idea of the management fee is just what it says. It is an amount allowing the GP to manage the fund. A, G a GP operation resembles a small or medium-sized consulting business. The cost structure consists of the salaries of the team, the rent and cost of their office, the cost of business trips, plus some other overheads and miscellaneous costs. It should not become a money-making enterprise. So the question is, what is the risk that there is abuse of management fees? At what point does there exist a risk that the GP becomes engaged in a rent-seeking behaviour, where management fees represent a major source of profits to him? The way to answer this question is through some simple calculations. So please stay tuned for what's coming up. Let's use a bottom-up reverse engineering approach to figure out what is going on with management fees according to the type of manager. We start by looking at the typical cost structure of a private equity management team. As I mentioned, it looks like a middle-sized professional advisory firm, like a consultant or a law office. The main costs are going to be salaries, office costs, business trip costs and other overheads. We must consider three other items more specific to private equity. These are on the cost side, outside consultants and transaction costs, and on the plus side, fees charged to portfolio companies like director's fees. 
We will ignore these for the purpose of this analysis as they are not part of the core costs of the team. For example, transaction costs are more typically charged to the fund than coming out of management fees. And fees charged to portfolio companies may be offset into the management fees. It will vary a lot according to type of fund. Now let's create two private equity management team profiles. The first one is a lower mid cap team. It's more of a bare bones team with a minimum essential to actually function. Two senior people, a few more junior, a secretary and an office in a more economical part of town and travel more locally to their more local investments. The second one is a much larger team you might find in a buyout fund. Six partners and 24 other professionals, a big office in the best part of town, lots of longer distance travel given the wider reach of their portfolio. Let's consider salaries as it's the biggest item. Our table based upon reports from a well-known PE recruitment firm gives me salary ranges which vary according to assets under management and three levels of seniority, which I will use for my estimates. I would just note that in the smaller funds, and especially in emerging markets, you will frequently find salaries as low as half of the ones shown in the lower range of the table. I do the numbers on the costs of each respective team and I get 1.5 million euros per year for my mid cap team and 10 million euros for my big buyout team. Let's assume a 2% management fee for my mid cap fund and 1% for my buyout fund. This results in a minimum economic fund size of 75 million on the bottom end and 1 billion maximum economic size on the top end. Let's summarize our conclusions. This is important because the conclusion depends on the size of the fund. If the fund is over 1 billion, there exists the very strong probability that a lot of the management fees will represent a major source of profit to the GP, even if he goes large on salaries, bonuses, offices, and fancy business trips emptying out the minibar. If the fund is between 300 million and 1 billion, there exists the strong probability that the GP will be able to set aside a good portion of the fees as a kind of reserve, without it going as far as becoming a parasitic rent. If the fund is between 75 million and 300 million, the chances are that most or all the management fee will be legitimately spent on operating costs. If the fund is between 25 and 75 million, we are getting more into the area of developmental type funds, which may be properly managed, but the people will not be bringing in full commercial salaries, due perhaps to a not-for-profit mission or being in an emerging market with different cost bases. If the fund is below 25 million, it is simply difficult for it to be properly managed without other arrangements, like a management fee subsidy or a not fully dedicated team. My final conclusion is that there is a legitimate debate to be had about the fee structures charged by very large funds such as the mega funds, and whether LPs of these funds, many of which are pension funds managing ordinary people's savings, are getting a fair deal. Professional associations should issue some more guidance on this matter, especially the reporting, and we look forward to that.